Good morning, CPC. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this first snowy Sunday of the fall and Thanksgiving weekend. It's good to be together. We're going to be small but mighty this morning. Some sad news to start off with this morning. Uh, Jim Kenny, who many of you knew, has died. I saw Jim on Thanksgiving morning. He was at the Israel Hospice House by that time, having suffered a couple of strokes. And so he quit his dialysis, and yesterday morning he passed. There will be a memorial service for Jim here at CPC on Monday, December 4th at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Please remember Rachel Kenny especially within the last couple years. Rachel's lost her sister Beth, uh, her mom Shelly, and now her dad Jim. So please be in prayer for her and for the Kenny family. Also a note that I received uh, via email this morning, uh, Judy Brooks wanted to, wanted to have some prayers for her daughter on a trip from Virginia to Ames over the weekend. Uh, she suffered a seizure, and, uh, but they have determined that she doesn't have a tumor, brain tumor by a CT scan, but continued prayers for her. We'll be, we'll mention, we'll be able to pray for these things during the prayer time later, but, but those were noted to me ahead of time and I wanted you to know. Also, Carol Bundy, who was supposed to be our liturgist this morning, is homesick. And so Joshua Fori Boateng has agreed to be my liturgist this morning. So Joshua, thank you for that last minute agreement. Joshua and a number of other of our new elected officers will be ordained and installed next Sunday in both services. So I hope you'll come and join us on that first Sunday of Advent. The sanctuary should be beautifully decorated for Christmas by then, but only if you help. So that's my introduction to the next announcement. On Wednesday night, we're going to have a dinner with our club CPC at 6 p.m. And then anybody who would like to help decorate the sanctuary afterwards, we would appreciate your help. That'll happen starting at 6.30. The more the merrier and the faster it'll go if uh, several of us show up. Last year, I recall that I and Josh Hibben, who's very tall, were standing, we were standing on the sides of the pews, hanging up wreaths uh, over where those crosses are on the brass plates. I really don't want to have to do that at my age anymore, so if any of you want to come and help me, or at least steady me while I do that, uh, let's gather together and make the sanctuary a beautiful place for Christmas. So Wednesday night, 6 o'clock for the dinner down in the social hall, followed by decorating our sanctuary. It's good to be together this morning. Let's prepare our hearts to worship God. I don't know about you, but as long as I don't have to travel long distances in it, I always feel peaceful when it snows, especially the first snowfall. And we have Thanksgiving for which to be thankful and to feel God's peace. So let's share our peace that we experience with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Amen. 
Let's stand and share signs of that peace.
join me in the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's love and glory spread. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. God's love endures forever. Who made the sun to govern the day? Who made the moon and the stars to govern the night? God's love endures forever. Who gives food to every creature? Who makes our earth sustenance? God's love endures forever. We give you thanks this day and praise to our Creator. For God's love endures forever. and confession followed by silent and personal prayer. Gracious God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. We have so much for which to be thankful. The life that pulses in our bodies, the health we enjoy, the expressive faces of friends, the warmth of family love, the lifting power of faith, the rich harvest of land and sea, the never-ending march of seasons, the bounty of earth our home, and the glorious story of your love in Jesus Christ. Yet we confess our neglect of thanksgiving. We take so much for granted. Forgive us our redeeming, that we might find gratitude in our heart and express it with our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
now the assurance of forgiveness. God of mercy, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of Christ. Not as we ask in our ignorance. But as you know and love us in Jesus Christ our Savior. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are see everyone okay so I want to start out with I have a mic can someone tell me what their favorite thing on like the Thanksgiving lunch table was this year yes Henry the cinnamon rolls Ooh, the cinnamon rolls nice thank you Henry anyone else got one yeah croissants Ooh, croissants Maybe nice Oh, that sounds amazing. Oh, I love that. You got one, Miles? Oh, what do you got? Nothing. Nothing? That sounds like an empty Thanksgiving table. <laughs> do we got any over there? Yeah, that. <laughs> gravy. Gravy's the best part. Perfect. This is Ann Gravy. Jameson, do you want to come over here to grab it? Yeah. All right, let's let Jameson go and then Henry. Lemon cream pie. Ooh, that sounds amazing. Eggnog! Eggnog? Nice! <laughs> awesome! Pumpkin and apple pie. Pumpkin and apple pie? That's awesome! Except we did have one. If 
was like, we made it the day before Thanksgiving. The apple tasted a bit weird because it was just, the pie was just sitting there for days. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so did anyone have like a big family get together for Thanksgiving? Big hands, okay. Did anyone have to sit at a place that is called the kids' table? Yes, okay. Don't have to, that's true. Kids' table, they would never experience that. As the youngest cousin, somehow the kids' table is now like a late 20s table, and I don't understand how that happens. But that's where we are. So, as I was sitting around the what was once called the kids' table, I was like, and looking at like my cousins and I, my siblings, I'm like, these people are like kind of weird, but I love them, right? But like, we've grown up, we're all a little different, there are things we like and don't like, and we all kind of have like different tastes. And then I'm like, when we were kids, that was true also. Because we would have a group that would like go play football, or a group that would like go downstairs and play video games. And so this Thanksgiving, I was thinking how thankful I was that we get to surround ourselves with people that are like different than us, have different interests than us, and how like cool it is to be surrounded by people that see the world differently. So I had three kids. One was kind of like a co-effort with a parent, but I had three kids draw turkeys for us, the same coloring page, so I wanted to see how different they would be. So this is one. See it? With this one. This one. And then we got this one. We got like different looking turkeys. Original. And then we got this one. The rainbow, yeah, we got rainbow turkey, we got different colored pumpkins. And this is all cool. Right, and I got more back there if y'all want to color in the gray space and think about like how you would color a turkey. I was thinking that I would like put a turkey in a hot in like a hockey jersey, but I didn't color. If I had that they had markers, I'd probably Go to the markers? Well I got some more back there. I, so you can draw you can do one. I am so good at shading with markers, even really? though they don't that's awesome. One time I had this little coloring page that was filled with math equations, and I was kind of just underneath the wing, I just kind of put it down. That's awesome. So one of the things that, oh, I got two mics. That was extra loud. Uh, you your own drawing business? Oh, that's so cool. You draw me something. Uh, but one of the things I'm really thankful for this Thanksgiving and being at CPC is how many places we have in the church that get to resemble us, that get to resemble you, right? So we have like our grace space, and we have this time, and we have our basement. And I was really thankful that we have a church where sometimes we might look around the table and be like, hmm, kind of like I was with like my brothers and my other cousins, but we all get to have a place at the table, and we all get to have a church that has so many different avenues and that gets to resemble all of us, including all of you. So that was what I was really thankful so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then I have more of these back there. And I'll be honest, I did bribe someone with a Rice Krispie Treat, so if that is motivation, you can find me after the service. I will give you a Rice Krispie Treat. Yeah, absolutely. There you go, Henry. All right, so I'm going to go and pray for us. We're going to close our eyes and bow our heads. God, thank you for the children and youth of CPC and their families. Uh, thank you for the excitement and energy they bring. Uh, thank you for their love of being here and their love of filling our classrooms and the halls uh, and the laughter and joy they bring to our sanctuary. Uh, thank you for surrounding us with community that's thankful for us and that we can be thankful for. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Emily, for that great message and all the energy that our children have on this day. Before we hear our scripture reading, I invite you to please join me in prayer. God of love, God of healing, cleanse our hearts and minds today of thoughts that might dilute us, that might make us less compassionate and understanding of others and make us thankful this day for your transformative love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we'll be reading from Luke's Gospel. We're in chapter 17, 
reading verses 11 through 19. Luke 17, 11 through 19. I invite you to listen for a word from the Lord. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean, but the other nine? Where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to us. What would you say is the difference between being healed and being made whole? The difference between being cleansed and being saved? And can we legitimately be brought to wholeness apart from our relationships with others? Heavy questions for a Thanksgiving weekend, I know. For let's face it, the biggest questions we probably had to deal with this weekend have been, shall I have apple pie or pumpkin pie for dessert? Or do I want to watch the Packers game or the Cowboys game today? But that's not fair. There may have been more consequential questions this Thanksgiving with which we've had to deal. Questions perhaps like, shall I bring up with my estranged relative the hurt we've experienced in our relationship over these many years? Or will I address the addiction in my family member's life that is tearing apart the lives of those around him or her. For you see, if we do not think that folks ask these kind of deep questions over the holidays, then we are sorely mistaken. And then there's the nagging question of anxiety and depression in our culture at large today. I recently read a revealing article saying that from 2008 to 2019, high school students reported chronic feelings of sadness and hopelessness, and they rose from one in five to one in three reporting those feelings over those years. And that was before COVID-19 hit. By the autumn of August 2021, well into the pandemic, those same feelings of hopelessness and chronic sadness were now being reported by 42% of high school students and by 60% of girls. The sobering article went on to note that parents of struggling kids are not faring much better than their kids are. It highlighted a recent study with the title, Caring for the Caregivers, the critical link between parent and teen mental health. The report gets at one of the questions I posed a moment ago. Can being made whole occur apart from our relationships with others? In other words, in a world where we are confronted daily through the media with the pain and suffering of others, with wars and mass shootings, with economic disasters and financial fallout, with global warming and advancing climate change, how can we, you and I, arrive at wholeness? I mean, is it even possible today? First, though, a disclaimer. 
Beware of any sermon that offers a glib, one-size-fits-all solution to the world's big problems. It cannot be done. Existence is much too complicated for that. For instance, psychologists today are reporting that an increasing number of their regular clients and first-time patients are overly stressed about the state of the planet. In fact, just six years ago, in the wake of increasing economical turmoil, environmental disasters, the American Psychological Association officially designated eco-anxiety as a disorder characterized by a chronic fear of environmental doom. You see, it's a real thing, and it's prevalent. And thus, as I say, any single sermon, as much as I might like it to, is not going to be able to address fully the hopelessness and the angst that people are regularly feeling in our society today, even over the Thanksgiving holiday. A Sunday message over a holiday can simply hope to provide an illustration of something transformative that can assist us on our journey toward wholeness, and completeness. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, in this final installment in our study of Luke's Gospel, I've selected a passage of Scripture that I think can do just that for us. And as always with Luke, it may not be what we might expect. As you know by now, it's the story of ten lepers approaching Jesus. Leprosy, also called Hansen's disease, was, and still is, an infectious disease of the skin, which also regularly affects a person's peripheral nerves. If left untreated, leprosy causes permanent nerve damage and deformity of the hands, feet, and face. In Jesus' day, leprosy was cruelly considered a form of divine punishment for sins committed. Let me say that again. In Jesus' day, leprosy was cruelly considered a form of divine punishment for sins committed. The lepers, therefore, because of their appearance and their supposed sins, were outcasts from everyone they knew, and they were not supposed to approach anybody. But here in our story for the morning, 10 of them are approaching Jesus. And this is indeed the first reversal in Luke's narrative today. What these lepers do simply was supposed to not be done. Granted, the ten lepers, we are told, initially kept their distance from Jesus, as it was culturally required of them to do. You may have also heard stories about how lepers in the past were expected to ring bells prior to approaching a town or a city or a person in order to alert folks that they were passing by. You see, other people were simply freaked out by lepers. They were considered to be anathema. It was like during COVID-19. Remember back then, four years ago now? Remember how others would react on an airplane or in a waiting room if you were to cough or, God forbid, to sneeze? That's similar to how lepers were regarded all the time throughout their entire lives. At a distance then, we are told, the ten cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. We read that when Jesus saw them, he spoke to them in response. Notice that it doesn't say he yelled out back to them or he cried out to them. He spoke. In other words, there was no longer any distance between the lepers and Jesus. This is another reversal of what was customary in Jesus' time. And what Jesus then said to them up close was actually very funny. It doesn't read as funny today in our text, but it was. It was ironic and it was surprising. Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the priests. Well, what's funny about that? Well, the priests, according to Jewish law, were the ones who would declare whether someone previously diseased was newly clean or not. 
They were the ones to make the final determination. What's funny or ironic about Jesus' statement to the lepers is that they were not healed yet when he told them to go see the priests. The priests had nothing to decide. They still had leprosy. He says, go, go to the priests. He had not cleansed them yet. He had not made them whole yet. So why would they ever go to the priests to declare them clean when they were still diseased? I mean, it would be like today a border patrol agent saying to an undocumented worker, go to the employment office right now and show them your work permit and you can keep your job. Work permit? What work permit? The bewildered undocumented worker would exclaim, I don't have one. Why would I go to the employment office without a work permit? It would be laughable and ridiculous. But here's the really funny part. They all go. All ten lepers trustingly follow Jesus' direction to go and show themselves to the priests when they haven't been healed. They didn't have to do that. They didn't have to follow what Jesus said, but they were desperate. Here was this man who people were proclaiming as the Messiah, telling them to go do something, and they did it. The pain and the anguish in their lives was so pronounced, it had lasted so long that they went against all hope. And as they went, as they went, guess what? They were all made clean. That's not supposed to happen either. The priests are supposed to make the determination, not God. And for the poor, marginalized hearers of this story that Luke was telling it to, for the outcast followers of Jesus, this was an amazing turnaround. You mean this is possible? They're all made clean? What a great ending to this tale. Only, only it's not the ending. All those on the margin have been cleansed. All of the ten lepers have been healed like a touchdown dance in the end zone of a football game, we can excuse the players for their excitement and even for their forgetfulness at this moment. They've just won. Who cares if they follow the rules at this point, if they spike the ball or hurl it into the stands, if they take off their helmet and get a delay of game, who cares? They've just experienced a profoundly exciting moment in their otherwise mundane and disciplined existence. But Jesus, Luke tells us, does care. You see, it's not enough when we gain victory in our lives. It's not enough when we succeed or accomplish and get and win and receive. What's really important, what's vitally important according to Jesus, is that we give thanks. But haven't we all forgotten to give thanks at one time or another in our lives? We're thinking about ourselves, about our good fortune or our blessing, and we celebrate it. We we rejoice in it. But we forget to give thanks for it. We experience it, but we fail to reflect upon it and to appropriately be grateful for it. That's what happens here in our story. One of the lepers, just one, when he looks down at his hands and suddenly realizes that he has been healed, turns back and with a loud voice, we are told, gives glory to God. Now, I've always wondered, and this is just how my mind works, I've always wondered if this gentleman indeed expressed his praise and thanksgiving with a loud voice, wouldn't the other nine lepers have heard him? And notice their healing too? And wouldn't they also have turned back and offered their praise and thanksgiving to Jesus too? I mean, wouldn't that make perfect sense? But then at this moment, Luke reveals something to us. As this leper, now a former leper, as he is prostrating himself at Jesus' feet and thanking him, Luke says simply, And he was a Samaritan. Boom. That's enough to rock any Jewish narrative. 
Those five words, and he was a Samaritan, explain why the other nine lepers might not have heard the shouts of this leper, or why they may not have responded if they had heard him shout. He was a foreigner. Maybe they hadn't known it when they were all covered up in their cloaks to hide their leprosy. Perhaps this fellow's deformed face had been so bad that the others hadn't recognized from his facial features that he was not of their nationality, not of their ethnicity. Perhaps he had remained quiet and hadn't spoken in an accent or a dialect that would have given him away. Maybe it wasn't until his outburst of thanksgiving and loud praise that the others suddenly realized that he was anathema to them. Not because he was a leper, as they all were, but because he was a Samaritan, a despised half-breed, not fully Jewish, not completely a Gentile, but some freakish abnormal in-between. Maybe that's why they wanted to be nowhere near him when he returned to Jesus. Isn't it weird that all those who were all truly outcast in their culture would, once they were healed, nevertheless ostracize further one of their fellow outcasts? Isn't it sad? But we do this too. We distinguish between ourselves for the littlest things. We discriminate against our fellow human beings, against our fellow Americans, against our fellow Iowans, against our fellow believers in God with attitudes and actions that dehumanize and cripple them. For notice that this despised half-breed Samaritan praised God when he was made clean, praised God. That's what his fellow former lepers may have heard when this one recognized that he'd been healed. He wasn't praising the devil. He wasn't glorifying himself or his good fortune or his good luck. No, this healed leper, this healed leper Samaritan was giving glory to God. And Jesus, fully Jewish, asks this Samaritan somewhat rhetorically, I believe, uh, were not 10 made clean, but the other nine. Where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Now we've spent weeks on end analyzing Luke's reversal in his gospel in this sermon series. The social, cultural, and religious power dynamics that he overturns with his writings. It's nothing short of revolutionary in its import. And here Luke does all three of those things at once. Socially, this man was a leper. He was diseased, disregarded, and degraded. Culturally, he was a half-breed, a Samaritan, half-legitimate, half-acceptable, and believed to be half-hearted, which in reality meant that he was not legitimate, not acceptable, and not to be believed. And on top of all that, culturally and socially, religiously, he was on the outside, excluded, not welcome. And who says thanks? Who praises God? Who is truly grateful? The story ends with Jesus saying to this foreigner at his feet, get up, go your way. Your faith has made you well. But wait a minute. I thought he had already been made well on his way to the priest. Right? Why is Jesus proclaiming his wellness now? Unless, of course, there's a difference between being cleansed and being made well. Unless there's a subtle distinction between being healed and being completely saved. 
Where does our gratitude become salvation? Where does our healing become wholeness and wellness? My friends, in this world that delivers anxiety to us, that generates hopelessness and angst and the fear of environmental doom, where racism and sexism and discrimination and xenophobia run rampant, can thanksgiving for what we've been given, can glorifying God for what God has made us and for how God has offered us wholeness and fullness, can being deeply grateful for the spiritual and societal resources that God has provided for us change us? Can that fully felt and fully expressed gratitude transform not only our body, but our soul and our spirits as well? And if so, then where? Where are we when it comes to thanking Jesus and God our creator for what God has done for us? Are we at God's feet? Praising and thanking, crying and being grateful? Or are we somewhere else? Experiencing the privilege that we've had our entire lives. Where are we today? And where will we be this week? This week after Thanksgiving? May it not be a week after wholeness, May it not be a week after healing. May it not be a week after gratitude. May it be this week too. May we go into this week not leaving behind gratitude and hankering for the stores and the Christmas rush and the things we get. May we hold on to this gratitude throughout this month so that others may know that we love God and we're grateful for them. If we can do that, if just everybody in this room and online could do that, think of the change and the transformation it would make in this place we call home and in our world today. The anxiety might flee. The hopelessness might go away. Maybe as we give thanks to our God. May it be so for you and for me. Happy, ongoing thanksgiving and gratitude to you. Amen. I invite you to remain standing and please join me responsively in our Thanksgiving litany as printed in your bulletin and will appear on the screens. God of all grace, from your great heart 
has come a flood of gifts. In lives of service, by kindness to a stranger, and with concern for each other, Keep us mindful in our plenty of those who do not have. Strengthen within us the muscles of generosity and the will to give. Correct us when we abuse the land. Straighten us when we fail to honor the heritage of different peoples. Mold us where we need to be molded. Change us where we need to be changed. For we are thankful for your guidance and love. We are grateful for your care and compassion. We're going to do double duty this morning. I have a few connection cards, and I'm going to pray right now about these that have been given to me. And then our ushers have microphones this morning, and after we've said that prayer, I'm going to have them disperse, and any of you who would like to, raise your hand and share, hopefully in a short sentence, uh, something for which you're grateful and thankful today. And then we'll pray again after those prayers of gratitude are shared. But here's one to start with. Grateful for Simon Marshall Gilbert's 17th birthday this past Friday. We love him so much. So where is Simon here? Did I see him? He's back there, over there, over here. There's Stephen. Oh, he went to the bathroom. All right, well, let's just be honest about it, right? Okay, when he comes back at some point today, Wish him a happy birthday and wish him well. It was good timing, Simon. Um, this is a prayer from Jim Pope. Pray for my brother-in-law. He will be having open, bi open heart bypass surgery this coming Thursday. Also pray for family. And um, prayers for Jay Sorovi and her daughter Min. Um, Min is in the hospital in Minneapolis right now. Let's pray for these things. Oh God, in the midst of our celebration and thanks and gratitude and perhaps carefreeness this weekend, there are serious and important things going on in people's lives. Help us not to forget them, but to lift them up in prayer and in blessing. We pray for Min, that you'd be with her in healing as she's in the hospital up in Minneapolis. Be with her by your spirit, grant her peace and uh, calmness, and give the doctors, nurses wisdom to know how to treat her and how to take care of her. We're grateful for Simon's birthday for a chance to celebrate those years and all that he's lived through after being in Namibia this past year, coming back here, having perspective that others don't. May you bless him in the years to come that he might employ that understanding and perspective in all of his relationships. And we pray for Jim's brother-in-law. Um, we ask that the bypass surgery he'll be experiencing will be successful and that he would find healing and even wholeness. Uh, bless the family as well as they wait, perhaps with anxiety for him and what will occur. God, thank you that you are with us in all circumstances. And we continue to pray for the Kenny family, especially, especially Rachel, at uh, Jim's loss and his death this weekend. Comfort her by your spirit. And we also pray for Judy Brooks' daughter and ask your blessing on her life as well. In Jesus' name, amen. We heard the kids share it this morning, but I'm going to let our ushers come around with their microphones and let us share, as you will, uh, a sentence of gratitude or thanksgiving that you have today. You can be as specific as you want to or as general as you prefer. Our, our ushers have microphones. I'm really thankful. Uh Recently, I accepted a new position as a hospice chaplain. I just completed three weeks of training, and I love my new job, so I am very thankful for that. All right. That is fantastic. And Jen continues to do her job with us, all part-time here as a praise band leader. We're excited for you. Others to share. You're not all going to turn shy on me, are you, at one time? There's one way in the back there, Stephen.
couple back there. Who's going to go first? Okay. For being able to spend Thanksgiving with my grandparents and something kind of funny that actually happened. Even though I'm 14, I was offered a job at Wild Birds Unlimited yesterday when I went there with my mom and my grandma. Wow. So. A job offer in addition to being with your, your grandparents. Great news. Yes, Henry, I think. I'm thankful for my family and friends and the fun times I've had with them. Good. Many more to come. And Jenny. I'm also thankful for my family, not just because they are just my family, but I was ill last week and my kids took care of me while AJ was gone. They took me into bed and made me tea. And I've been working a lot of long hours as a small business owner, and they've still taken care of me. And so I've just really felt the love and care for my family. Mm -hmm. Way to go, boys. Good job. I'm Diane Patton. And we had an opportunity yesterday to be at lunch with folks in Boston. Uh -oh. Lost it. There we go. Uh, many of whom have been involved with Habitat for Humanity. And it was wonderful to hear not only about home building here in the United States and in Iowa, but internationally. Many of these folks have traveled to other countries to build homes for families. Hmm. Great. Thank you. I'm thankful for the music here at CPC from Laura's wonderful um, intro this morning, Prelude, and the choir, and then the praise choir, too. Amen to that. Thank you. Evelyn. I'm Evelyn Schneibels, and about a week ago, I got a folder from YSS, Youth and Shelter Services here. We uh, contribute to that, but it's, it's their annual report. And I was going through that, and there were so many UCC uh, names uh, in that booklet. I'm thankful for all the members of this congregation who've contributed to that organization, and people who are on the boards also, and so, thanks to all of you. Sometimes it's surprising to realize how many of us are involved in the community, isn't it? Thank you, Evelyn. Oh, Steve. Simon, happy birthday. <laughs> we're, glad you're, we're glad you're here with us today. That was shared while you were out. Others to share. I want to share, I am thankful for my stepfather, Chuck. Uh, Nita and I talked to him on Thanksgiving, of course, in California. Uh, if you would have said 10 years ago that Chuck would have outlived my mother, my father, uh, Anita's uh, brother's wife, and uh, several others in our lives, we would have said no possible way because he had so many conditions and so many things he was struggling with. But he's hanging in there today. He was born in 1936, and, uh, and Chuck is an amazing person. So I want to give thanks for his life and his influence on us and on our family. Anyone else? Let's pray again. God, our hearts are filled with gratitude and thanksgiving today for most of what we shared, for the people who are in our lives, for those who have an impact on us, for those who take care of us when we are not well, who pray for us when we're struggling, who rejoice with us when we have a new accomplishment, like a new job, a new ministry, and for those who come alongside us when we simply need a friend to encourage so thank you for these gifts, for this place in which we live, this church in which we worship, and the people around us today that remind us that faith in you and glorifying you make a difference in our lives. Help us today in our gratitude, O oh God, to go out into this world and be those who exude a spirit of gratitude and thankfulness, of encouragement, support, welcome, and hope. We love you. And together now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The world and all it contains, the earth and all who live in it belong to God and are blessed by God. In our blessing, let us give back a portion of what we've received for God's work and for the upbuilding of the church. The ushers will come forward for the morning offering. receive these gifts from our hands to yours. Distribute them to those in need. May it build up your ministry of love and good news. And may your name be honored and glorified. We ask it through Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Thank you.
ask God's people go out today in gratitude and thanksgiving and praise. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up God's countenance upon you and grant you God's peace this day and every day. Hallelujah. Amen.